Awesome. Oh, you're doing a lot better than I am then. <laughs> so that's impressive. And what I've decided to start doing is actually just describe some of my emotions before the start of each group. The reason why I feel that this needs to be done is many of you are still judging emotions as negative and so therefore not allowing yourself to experience those emotions and also judging uh, the feeling of emotions as somebody in a bad place. How many of you feel like that? If, if they're feeling emotion, they're in a bad place. It's in a bad place. And, and it's very important to understand that that's not true. Actually, when you're feeling your emotions, and particularly your causal emotions, you are in the best possible place you can be. And so it's very important that you understand that. And one of the ways I hope you will come to understand that is by me demonstrating that to you through my own emotions. So my own emotions this week weren't very pretty. Um, myself and Mary spent most of the week apart. Mary was with uh, Millie, who many of you know, uh, dealing with some anger-related stuff, weren't you, darling? And mostly to do with some rape-related stuff in the first century, actually. Could I have... Oh, I've got one. Right. Does, anyone not have one? Does anyone not have an outline for today? So the consequence of that is that Mary didn't feel very much like uh, speaking today, so she's going to just make some comments during the day. And the other consequence of it is that uh, I've been feeling a lot of grief this week, and so, of course, the outline got done at the last minute again, like this morning again. And, uh, and most of the grief I've been feeling um, has been related to... Uh, the, the situation that I believe myself to be in, which isn't true from God's perspective, but it is a feeling that I have, and it's the feeling that whatever I do, I'm not going to be happy in the end. How many of you feel that? Whatever you do, you're just not going to ever get happy. So it's a very common feeling. Oh, thanks, darling. And so one of the reasons why I feel that is because um, in the first century, whenever I acted completely in truth, of course that also encouraged the people who were in error to actually act in disharmony with love towards me in return. So the more in truth I was, the more aggro I got from people around me. And in the end, that, uh, that aggravation, which was mostly felt by many of the disciples, um, that aggravation actually caused them to think that I wasn't... I wasn't probably thinking very clearly, is what they believed, and they felt quite condescending toward me at times. And so what they finished up doing was planning for me to have some confrontations, as if I didn't have enough already. And uh, in the process of those confrontations, my death obviously resulted. Um, and so, so the problem for, my, for myself is that the one thing that I really want to do is get together with my beautiful soulmate and... Uh, and spend our life in happiness together, right? And many of you probably have that as your primary desire. And in amongst that, of course, um, that, of course, never happened in the first century. We got together only for a period of 18 months or so, and I passed. So I didn't get what I wanted out of that. And then, of course, um, in passing, a lot of the personal goals and desires I had about world vision, which are goals and desires I had right from the first century. So many of the things we'll be discussing today are goals and desires that I've had for a long, long, long time. And most of them meant that on the earth they never came to fruition. So I never saw the results of what my goals were, which is another feeling I have of failure. And so I have these deep feelings of failure and grief about all of that that I've had to work through this week. And it's all just still caught up in here, like right there, the grief is not being expressed, and, but I can just feel it. It's affecting me quite a lot today. I also have a lot of uh, terror that I was dealing with this week to do with uh, my potential death this time as well. And, uh, and in particular, it was to do with the feeling that um, in the first century, it was the people who were closest to me who finished up creating my worst problems, if you like. And the reason why is they thought they understood 
what was being taught, but they only understood it at an intellectual level. They never understood it with their heart. And as a result of that, as a result of not understanding it with their heart, they then went down this track of making many decisions without my knowing that actually affected my life. And of course, in the end, created my death. And so, and, and I also see some patterns of that already beginning in amongst many of you doing the same kind of thing. And so that's just triggering this emotion in me of, uh-oh, you know, my life's going to be way out of my control and other people will be actually finishing up determining my future. How many of you feel like that with regard to the government, you know, that you're in, you know, the religions we're in perhaps and also that other people are determining your future? So it's a big emotion I have to work through as well. And, uh, and so as a consequence of that, I've spent a fair portion of the time this week crying um, and dealing with some terror and grief. And so uh, today I've still got a lot to deal with that came up yesterday that I haven't dealt with. And so I'm still in this place of, you could say, uh, disconnectedness, I suppose, pretty much. So that's where I'm at. So we'll see how I go today delivering a talk about future vision. And of course, uh, a lot of this has got a lot to do with um, some of my fears about my future, the future vision. Now, in this talk about future vision, um, I'm going to talk about my future vision in terms of our personal feelings and emotions and the future vision in regard to world changing type events and, and situations. So we're going to break them into two, the two parts. The second part we'll probably discuss after the break. And the first part we'll be talking more about emotions and my vision about emotions and so forth. Does that make sense? So that's what we'll be covering today. And my purpose for doing it is that a lot of people are misconstruing or misconceiving what my desires are. And one of the reasons why is they think that I want to set myself up as a cult leader or some kind of thing like that. And in the process of that, and you will find that many of you have already been told that, oh, it's just a cult. Haven't they? How many of you have been told that already, like, from somebody else? Okay. How many of you actually felt that yourself? Come on, be honest. Yeah, okay. More than that. <laughs> Particularly at the beginning, right? <laughs> and, and there's a lot of uh, misconstruction of my own desires and feelings. So what I wanted to do was express to you what my desires and feelings are about all of that stuff. You know, how I want to become a world-dominating leader and <laughs> the leader of the one world religion. And, and like, I've just got this power-hungry, power-mad part of me. <laughs> no, it's not like that at all. Um, it's the worst possible thing I could think of, actually. And it always has been. So what I'd like to do is describe to you some of my real feelings about all of these kind of things. And I also would like to talk to you a little about your own desires and how they will actually come into this process of the world vision. And when I say the world vision, I'm not talking about my world vision. I'm talking about the vision that God has always had for mankind living on earth. And in fact, it's the vision that many of you, if you dreamed about a utopian vision of the future for mankind on earth, many of you have had this same vision. All right? Many of you have thought that you would like all wars to cease, for example. Agreed? Many of you have thought that why can't we all just get along? Many of you, when you've gone out to go to travel to another country, have stood in line at an immigration and thought, why is this process happening? Why can't I just go anywhere in the world? Many of you have thought that, haven't you? And when about when you go to hospital, have you thought, why is there so many sick people? Wouldn't it be lovely that you know, there was far less sick people, hardly any sick or no sick people? What's going on there? And when, you go to, when the kids are going to school, many of, the ch of your own children have thought, I don't want to go to school. <laughs> Many of you, when you went to school, thought, I don't want to go to school. Agreed? And, uh, and why is that? It's because obviously there's all of these different things that you already know inside of yourself are in disharmony with truth and love. And, and yet what we do is we look at the world and we go, 
this world I've got to live in, I've got to live in reality. We basically say to ourselves that this world that's being constructed that we're living in right now is reality. And my utopian dream is just a dream, it's not reality. I I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with that. My utopian dream is reality, and this world that you're living in is a dream. Right? And it's going to remain that way, because remember, all dreams fade in time. And what's left in the end, the way God's constructed the entire universe, is that what's left in the end is always going to be truth. So, anything that's based on falsehood is going to just completely disappear. If it's going to completely disappear, then it's only a dream. So what we're living in right now, although it causes us pain and emotional hardship and physical hardship and physical pain and so forth, in the end, it is only a dream that we've constructed, ourselves as humanity have constructed and maintain in an effort to avoid our own emotions. Now, as soon as I start actually connecting to my own emotions and not wanting to avoid them, what happens? Well, what happens is something totally different. We start seeing the reality of what's being created. What's being created doesn't need to exist. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. So the basis of that, of course, is truth and your emotions. Because without those things, you will not be able to live in a, in a, in a real world that God designed us to live in. So the dream world that we're living in now although it causes much pain and suffering and hardship, the pain and suffering and, har and hardship is just a reflection back to us saying what you're creating is actually out of harmony with love. And the pain is the result or it's the feedback mechanism telling us that what we're doing is out of harmony with love. And we need to understand that completely before we can change anything. You see, most of the time when we're in pain, what do we finish up doing? We finish up blaming something external to ourselves for the pain that's been created. I'll give you a, just a very brief example. Taxation time, just recent, right, for us here in Australia. What did you feel? Did you feel the pain of how much taxation you paid? Right? Many of us just say, oh, it's just we have to pay and off we go, but we ignore the emotion. But if you just sit down there with the emotion and if you're running a business or you, you know, you've got your private taxation when you go to work and you see, oh, 25%, 30% of my, all of the earnings that I did this year went to somebody else. Does that feel painful to you? Yes. Of course it does, doesn't it? And anything that feels painful is out of harmony with love. So, I've got to have a look at that. Can you see? Like, straight away we can tell when things are out of harmony. The problem is, is that we've taught from a very, very young age to ignore the pain that we're in. And therefore, as a result of that, ignore the fact of everything around us seeming unloving to me. And so we start even telling ourselves things like, oh, that was loving. So we start telling ourselves a message, for example, like, I have to pay taxation. Without taxation, there'd be no roads and no hospitals and so forth. How many of you have told yourself that every time you pay the taxation? It's not true. And we can talk a bit later when I talk about the political vision and the economic vision that it isn't true at all. But it's something we tell ourselves to avoid feeling the pain we feel when we write out that cheque or we see how much we've paid in taxation. Does that make sense? And this is what we need to do with the entire world. Many of us look at the entire world and are very thankful that we live in a Western society or in a developed country where we're not starving every day, where we're not having to actually, you know, spend all of our day just getting enough food to eat. Now, there's two-thirds of the world that are in that state. And many of us just totally ignore that in our day-to-day -day life, don't we? Because, again... We don't want to feel the pain that would be within us if we felt that. You see how much the pain is a good thing to show us? And we need to allow ourselves to feel the pain. And when we feel the pain, we will want one thing, and that is to change. And what we want to talk about today is what kind of changes need to happen in the world and how they will happen. So, sounds like an interesting enough discussion.
and I'm happy to answer any questions while we go through it today about the subject, if we can. <laughs> All right. Now, the first thing I'd like to talk to you about, and something that's come up a lot, is many of, many of you have come from spiritual backgrounds where you found a spiritual teacher and then you followed that path that this teacher has taught you to a certain degree, and then you found, oh, it doesn't work for you anymore, and then so you stop following that spiritual teacher and you go and find another spiritual teacher, right? And then you follow what he or she says down to a certain direction and it fascinates you and so forth until no longer fascinates you anymore and you feel a bit stuck and then you don't follow that anymore and then go on to another one. How many of you have done that during your spiritual progression? So quite a lot. Now, many of you are also starting to do that with me. And that's not what I want. I do not want you to treat me like I'm your guru. <coughs> I am not a guru. I am not an avatar. <coughs> I'm a normal human being. I have my own desires and wants. And my own loves. And I'm just normal with them. Now, every time you set me up as someone above yourself, you're actually breaking one of God's laws. Did you know that? It's a law of love you're breaking, actually. Because the truth is that we are all guys as loved by God as any other. Right? However, we don't all feel that love the same amounts, and we don't have, all of us have the same amount of love within us because of different emotional things that we're experiencing. But from God's perspective, she wants your love and wants to give you her love as much as she's given me her love and wanted my love. So you and I are no different from each other. So that, bearing that in mind, it changes a lot of how you deal with me. Can you see that? Many of you still have a daddy thing going on with me. Right? In that you want my approval. Why do you want my approval? My approval is worthless. Can you see that? Like, it's worthless. It's a worthless thing. Well, I might die tomorrow and then what, where will my approval be? Well, I'll be still feeling it perhaps in the spirit world. <laughs> but where will you be? You won't get the feeling from me by the words that I might give you if I give you my approval now. Right? So, so why do you want my approval? There must be an emotional reason. Many of you are coming up to me and saying, oh, I would really, really like to do this. What do you think of that? Why are you doing that for? Does it, it doesn't matter what I think of it at all. Can you see why? Because in the end, all that matters is, is it loving or is it unloving? <coughs> and who determines all of that? Not me. I don't determine that. God determines that. And if you have a relationship with God, you can ask God whether it's loving or unloving easy enough and get an answer from God. So you don't need me at all. You don't need me to tell you what's loving or unloving. You need to develop your relationship with God so that God can tell you what's loving or unloving. Does that make sense? So many of you start focusing your attention on me when really what you need to be doing is focusing your attention on God and your own desires and passions. Can you see that? Rather than on me. Every time you focus your attention on me, there's a few different emotional reasons why you do it. One is that you're needy. Why do you need me to give you something when you could easily just go ahead with trusting yourself and do it yourself? Why do you need an emotion from me in order to validate your path? The truth is you don't. Can you see that? You just don't need that. Another option might be that you're actually seeking <coughs> approval. Well, like I said, my approval is worthless. The only person that you need approval from is God, and God always gives you approval. So, you don't even need to earn that either. So, what's the point of doing that at all? The point is that you're trying to satisfy an emotion within yourself when you do that. And you need to allow yourself to feel, I'm not approved of. AJ just thinks I'm terrible. He never listens to me. He never wants to speak to me. And you need to just go ahead and feel that. But in the end, it doesn't matter that I don't speak to you. Or I don't listen to you. Because in the end, 
I'm just as important or just as not important as you are. We are the same. I am no higher or lower than you. What other reasons might you have for coming up to me and wanting me to be involved in your process? Well, a lot of times, one of the reasons is that we want to actually deny self-responsibility. You see, what we do a lot is we go, mm, if I do what I really want, my wife's probably not going to love me anymore, my kids are probably going to feel really offended, you know, my in-laws are going to feel really angry, uh, my, job, my boss at work is going to be very disappointed, and so forth. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to my guru, right, and I'll involve him in my process of decision making. What do you think of this? And, I, and we can say, he can say whatever he thinks of it. And now who can I blame when all these people complain? I can blame the guru, right? I can involve him in the blame as well. In other words, I don't want to take personal responsibility for my life. Right? We all need to learn to take personal responsibility for our life on the divine love path. That's, the whole part, that's one part of the path. Taking full personal responsibility for everything you feel inside of you, every desire you have, every passion you have, every longing you have. Can we have a mic just there? Uh, you need to just flick the mic up. Right up. Hi. Um, one of the things that I'm aware of, because this path is relatively new, for me, I think I know what I'm doing and I, I think I'm on the right path, but I have doubt that comes up, yep. which makes me unsure about, you know, well, what is truth and what is, what is love and what is not, and are there spirits, um, you know, governing me that are maybe taking me on the wrong path? And I think that's what, why I... Um, in all, some ways give my power away. Yep, okay. Yeah. And um, when, when you are fully trusting yourself, and part of the process of this, on this path is learning to fully trust yourself. And I don't mean by that fully trusting your intellect. Because in fact, your intellect is totally untrustworthy in most cases. What is logical isn't often very true. So what we need to do is learn to trust our emotions. Now that's what we're doing. And so remember our soul, is our emotions, right? So here's our soul, what is it? Our emotions, passions, desires, let's say longings, shall we, as well. That'll do for the moment. There's two influences again, what are they? Right, error and truth, right? So if I'm in my emotions, this emotion that I'm feeling right now is either error-based or true. It's as simple as that. I still need to feel it. So let's say the emotion is, um, my husband doesn't love me. Now my husband might love me, but I might feel that my husband doesn't love me because when I was young and I grew up without my father, my father didn't love me, I didn't have any love from a male, and so I believe no man really loves me. Does that make sense? And that then begins imposed upon my relationship. But I still need to feel it. So I go down the track. I feel my husband doesn't love me. Is that the causal emotion? No, because my causal emotion is always in my childhood. So I know that. So it's got to be something to do with a man who didn't love me in my childhood. And I allow myself to feel the error that nobody loves me or no man loved me in my childhood. Now the truth is that God loves you and God's got a masculine quality and God loved you when you were a child and the truth is you probably had some spirits around you who loved you when you were a child as well so it's not true that actually nobody loved you even when you were little right? and no man loved you if you had no father when you were little but it's the truth that you feel and you need to feel it even if it's an error so all I need to do is focus on being remember I use the word humble all the time what is humble? having a passionate desire and longing to feel all of my own emotions. Right? Whether they are error or truth. I just need to have a passionate desire to feel them. When I feel them, I need to feel them at the causal level, not at the layer level, you know, not the top layers, but at the cause. I need to feel them at the cause. When I feel them, they'll be released from me and I won't believe them anymore. So you will find that you can actually, with your doubt, for example, go fully into your doubt. Right? So doubt is an emotion that most of you have, right? With regard to the divine love path, still. You don't have yet 
an example right in front of you of someone who's become at one with God. Is that correct? Okay, so because you don't have that example of someone who's become at one with God, there is going to be doubt in your minds until a person becomes at one with God, right in your midst. Isn't that correct? So at that point in time, you will have no doubt. You will see that somebody did it, and you'll know that that's how he did it or she did it. Right? But up until that time, you're going to have some doubt. So how do I work through my doubt? I need to feel it. It's an emotion, just like every other emotion, and it's an error-based emotion because it's a motion that... Because when I, when I feel my way through all doubt, I will know what's true and what isn't. And it doesn't mean that you'll think that what I'm saying is true. I'm saying you will know in your soul what is true and what isn't. And you'll know whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Does that make sense? Perfect. Now, when you do that, you'll have released all doubt inside of yourself. So doubt is just like any other emotion. Allow yourself to feel it. What do I really feel about AJ? He could be manipulating me. He could be controlling me. He could down the track ask me for money and I'll feel beholding to him because he's done so much for me, which I haven't really, and, then, and so forth, right? You can just, you can list off like lots of reasons why you doubt me. But all you're doing is doubting what like, maybe a male or maybe, you know, God in a lot of ways. You, a lot of times I get projected emotion that you really need to be talking to God about. And one of them is that many of you doubt the existence of a personal God. Do you not? If you're frank, when it comes to when somebody in your family dies, how do you then feel about God? Does God really exist? Does God really have a plan for us? You know, we start going to... So talk about all those things with God. Feel those emotions. They are just emotions that you need to process. When you process them and release them, you will know in your heart the truth of every matter. And so the key is to actually allow yourself to firstly trust God and secondly trust yourself. And then thirdly, if others are trustworthy, trust them. And you will know whether they're trustworthy or not just by feeling it from them. Yeah. There's no other way to determine whether somebody's trustworthy or not. There's no intellectual way. You can sit down, you can sit down for a whole year and watch my every move, right? And then after a whole year, look at everything I've done and with your intellectual mind, think, well, why did he do that with that person when he didn't do the same thing with that person? And that person seemed to have the same problem as that other person did, right? No, I can't trust him not understanding the emotion behind both persons, you could easily do that. So what do you need to do? In the end, just be humble, feel all of this emotion, whatever it is, and, and, and just trust that this process will bring you to truth. Now, you don't have to trust it forever even. Just trust it for a month or two months or six months or 12 months, a period of time. Give yourself a period of time, maybe 12 months. I'm going to really get into my emotion. But make sure you're really getting into your emotion and it's the causal emotion and not some effect-based stuff because it's not going to work then. But do the experiment. Allow yourself to experiment. Then you'll be able to discover the truth. And we'll talk more about that in a minute because it's one of the issues I want to raise. Anna, it's over there. I um it's on. I just wanted to share something like with the the daddy emotions because I feel that's something that I've um that I've worked through quite a bit since mm -hmm. I've known you. Sure. Um I was always pretty uh, uh pretty fearful of you I felt. Mm -hmm. Um and then like my my dad died when I was 14. Um and when I started going out with Tris, um AJ's son, I uh, without without realizing it, um, felt like I needed to have a day's approval as my father figure. Mm. So like, I remember going over to like to your house for the first time and having this huge cry as we were driving down the road because I realized how much, how how anxious I was and how how desperate I was for your approval. Yep. And like that happened a couple of times through the times that we've been staying with you. <coughs> And um, like it was just a couple of weeks ago where I realised um, that that 
that was what I was doing. I was wanting you to be my daddy. Yeah. Um, and I was so, so hungry for your, for your love and approval. Yeah. And I feel like I've worked through heaps of that. Yeah. Because in the end, God's your daddy, right? Yeah. Who's your daddy? <laughs> Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Yeah. Good. Not, not me. Maybe Mary's daddy. I don't know. No. But it's a very important thing to work through because you see, many times what happens is you project emotions at me that you're actually needing to deal with with God. And, and what I'm trying to do with all of this teaching is giving you all the tools that you need to connect with God, not connect with me. The, the end result is, in the, at, at the end of this process, when you connect with God, I will feel more connected with you. And, so, and you will feel more connected with me. And ironically, you will also feel more connected with your husband, with your children, with your wife, with your parents, with your neighbours, with your friends, with people in another country, you will feel more connected with everyone as you connect more to God. That's, an end, that's the end result. But I don't want you to connect to me as your purpose. It's the last thing I want, to be frank. Like, I, don't you think I've had enough of worship for 2,000 years? Don't you think that? that I just, I mean, I'm really serious about that. I have had, I have got full of it. And I do not want that from anyone. Right? And in fact, every time you try to do that, I'm going to <laughs> say something to you about that. All right? From where I'm sitting now, I, I'm struggling with how you would not feel pain at the hungry children, at what they're doing to animals, at having to pay taxation. You know, so like there's this thing of, okay, feel that pain, but... Mm -hmm. I'm not clear that that would stop. When you feel the pain, remember the pain flows through you and it's like, a, like water flowing through you. It, it empties. And then you, you get to the end where you understand the truth of everything that's going on. When you understand the complete truth at the soul level, there is no pain. Pain is all associated with fear. And so, but you do need to feel it. You need to actually feel it pass through you. And as you're feeling it pass through you, what will happen is you'll transform this fear into truth as a part of that process. That's how a soul transformation occurs. Without you actually feeling it though, you're blocking the entire process of, it, of the soul transformation occurring. You will feel all of these different things and have compassion for all of them, but when you've finished through dealing with your own personal pain of it all, then you will actually be in a state of truth and love yourself that you can change it all. But it's only then. Does that make sense to everyone? It's like, so the, the, the key is to trust it. Mary want, wanted to say something too, though. Huh? Same thing, really. Yeah. What the reason we're having the pain is that it's resonating with some pain within us. Yeah. Um, and we can feel that what's happening is painful for them, and that's why we feel the pain. When we experience the pain, it will be replaced with what is truly loving and compassionate and motivated to act. Yeah. And also will be motivated to act. That's a very important part. So you'll actually act upon what you see. You won't be able to allow yourself to sit idly by and watch somebody else get hurt without actually acting upon it. And I don't mean that you hurt the perpetrator because that's acting upon it in an unloving way. I mean what you would do is you would attempt to actually help the perpetrator and the victim to work through the issues involved when you're in a state of compassion yourself. Before then, you will feel pain and you need to just allow that painful emotion to pass through you. Cry about it, whatever you need to do, grieve about it. Let it pass through and em empty from you. When it empties from you, there's nothing inside of you that it resonates with anymore. So is it, yeah, I think like Mary, when she said it's my own pain that I'm... That's it? Yeah. It's your own pain that you're feeling, yep. Yeah. But many of us ignore, what I'm getting at is many of us ignore our own pain. And that's a very dangerous state, because when you ignore your own pain, what happens is you create suffering, not only just for yourself, but everyone around you. And the majority of people have been taught on earth to ignore their own pain. Well, you look at the most of the medical industry, what is it about? Pain avoidance, management of pain, isn't it? That's why there's a whole pharmaceutical industry, the management of pain. 
right? We're taught over and over again to manage our pain, not to actually feel the underlying causal emotion or causal reasons inside of us of why the pain exists. Right? On a physical and emotional and spiritual level, this applies right across the board. Yeah? So it's very important to do that. Um, this week I've been going through uh, some very, very deep, deep, hurtful, gut-wrenching stuff. Yep. And I do talk to God and I do ask for help. I have seen some proof. Um, that he is answering me, but a lot of the time I feel he's not. Yep. And so would it be right in saying the more I feel and just feel, yep. the closer my connection I will have with God? Yep. And what I've been experiencing, because I believe this is what's happening, but I've been having some very because of releasing a lot of pain, I do feel a lot of love, joy and compassion. But I feel that I've been having so many highs and so many lows, it's getting too big. Who's going like this? Yeah. To be frank, every one of you should be. <laughs> the reason why is because what will happen most of the times is we go through the lead up to an emotion and we're often quite blocked. During that stage, we're sort of not good, not bad, but we're not really feeling either. Then we get to an emotion, and well, so we dig it down here, coming, we've gone this downward track when we're doing that. We get to the emotion, and now we're in the pits of despair. Right? So we feel our despair, or feel whatever the emotion is, and from that moment afterwards, we'll come up again, and we'll feel the high, and sometimes this might happen in one day, right? Yeah. Where you feel the high of, wow, you know, I just feel light, and breezy and you feel like going out and you might even go out and dance or whatever else, right? And then the next day something else comes up, right? And you ram it back down the, <laughs> down the seesaw. This is why it happens quite often. The reason why it happens is because we've got all this locked up childhood emotion that's unexpressed and unexperienced. And the only way for it to get out is to feel it. That's the only way it's going to come out. Now, most of us, though, have this strong intellectual desire to maintain a nice uh, semi-joyous plateau in our life. <laughs> That's like, you know, we like just a little bit of a wave up and down, but no big down. And I don't, don't like, don't go for those crying for a week, you know, that's out, you know. Most of us, even crying for five minutes is out. You know, a little tear running down is, is okay. Um, so we don't allow, right, our emotions to be fully expressed. When we start making this transition into the soul work, we start making this transition into our emotions being fully expressed. And because of that, when it's fully expressing our despair, it's going to be very low. You're going to feel very low. Right? And you need to allow that experience and not judge it. The majority of us judge it. We judge that place. In fact, we judge anything below here, what we'd call our equilibrium, right? Anything higher than that's great. You know, we're in bliss then, aren't we? We're like full of joy. And then, but anything lower than that, oh no, this is wrong, this is bad. What's AJ doing to me? Right? We have all these different emotions happen in this phase, right? These are our childhood emotions that are unexperienced, these ones underneath here, that are unexperienced and unexpressed, that without coming out of us, continue to create our law of attraction. And our, much of our law of attraction will be negative as a result of that. We need to feel them all. Stop judging your own negative emotional experiences and just have them. That's what we need to all do. Just have them. Now, one of those negative emotional experiences is this. I'm praying to God about all this painful thing that I'm feeling and I feel God is not answering. Well, that is also an emotional experience. You feel God doesn't care for you. So feel it. Swear and curse God for not caring at you if you need to, to get over that anger that you might feel and then get into the grief of what it feels like to not even have God want you in her life. Your own creator doesn't want you. How does that feel? Let yourself feel that. And when you let yourself through all of that, you will no longer feel that emotion. You see, the reason why we need to do it is because there's one basic truth that we need to understand about our soul. 
The basic truth we need to understand about our soul, so here's our soul, little soul here, not a big fat soul. <laughs> and I've been told the ladies like skinny souls, right? So anyway. <laughs> when I said there's a big fat soul, but a lot of people had a lot of trouble with that. Anyway. All right, so truth and error cannot exist on the same subject in our soul at the same time. Now let's try and understand that from an emotional perspective. This is, we're talking emotional perspective here. So our soul has an emotion. Let's say our soul has a passion or our soul has a desire. Let's say one of the desires of the soul, right, Many men have this desire, so I'll list some of men, men's desires here. Some men would love to have their ideal job. I think I heard a few days ago, ideal job would be to put suntan lotion on a lot of <laughs> ba babes in bikinis, right? <coughs> now, that, what I've just listed, is an unloving desire, right? Now, they still need to feel the desire, but, but while that desire is inside of them, the truthful desire, the one that's loving, cannot enter. So unless they get inside of themselves emotionally and find out why they have this desire, the truthful desire, which is the desire for your one partner, your soul mate, will never be able to enter you. So any man who's got in that state where he desires that, what I've just listed, that, you know, putting suntan lotion on a long string of barely clad women, what he's basically doing is denying the true soul desire for a soulmate in that process, and the true soul desire for a soulmate will never enter him until he releases emotionally from himself the desire that he has within himself to have many women have sexual attention from many women. Does that make sense? Now, one of them is an error, and one of them is the truth, and the truth and the error cannot coexist in the same soul at the same time on the same subject. It's a very basic thing to understand about our soul. So, being at our soul is emotions, passions, desires, longings. Every time I have a longing that's in error, I need to feel it, not necessarily act upon it, but feel it and find, dig down under it, into its emotional cause and experience the emotional cause so that it gets out of me so that the truthful desire or passion or longing can enter me. Does everyone follow that? It's a really basic thing to understand about the soul. That truth and error cannot exist in the same soul at the same time on the same subject emotionally. It just cannot happen. Of course, you're, you can think you know the truth and actually feel quite differently the truth at the same time. So I'm not talking about what's happening in your mind here. I'm talking about what's happening in your soul or your emotional state. You see, in your mind, you can think, and I know a man who uh, pursues women relentlessly, who thinks that he's a very, very spiritual person and connected to God. So that's his thought. Now, the, the truth is that he's connected to a whole group of spirits who just love sexual interactions with women and use him in that process. But he thinks they're God. And... He thinks that, but his soul at some point in the future will demonstrate the opposite. His desires are causing many women to hurt. Right? Now, I'm not saying that he's responsible for their hurt because they need to feel underlying emotions within themselves about their hurt. But what I am saying that he is, by his actions, creating hurt in his external environment because he believes in his mind that while he's having sex with women, he's connected with God. Right? Now, the truth and error can't exist in the same soul at the same time, but they can exist in the mind as different to the soul. You can actually have two thoughts on exactly the same subject that are totally opposite to each other in your mind. That's totally possible. 
but you can't have two feelings that are opposites in each, to each other on exactly the same subject at exactly the same time inside of your soul. That's the beauty of your soul. Your soul is very powerful in determining truth. Right? Now, I'm talking about truth and error here that enters you for good. I'm not talking about the temporary states that you may go through. I'm talking about the stuff that enters you for good. So, for example, I can have a longing to talk to Mary. The first time I met her, I had a longing to talk to her. I was blah, 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 though, and I didn't, right? But the first time I saw her, I wanted to speak with her, right? And uh, she came up to speak with me and wondered why I was uh, so seemingly illiterate, right? <laughs> she's, she's often told me how she just felt a little frustrated that uh, she just couldn't get me to say anything of importance that obviously I'd said to her parents at some point. <laughs> but uh, so, so what was existing in me? There was a feeling inside of me of unworthiness. Right? Now, I can think myself out of that as much as I want, but at the end of the day, my actions will probably betray my feelings most of the time. And my actions showed the feeling was that I felt unworthy of my soulmate's attention. All right? And I needed to actually deal with the error-based emotion inside of me about that. Now, that took a few weeks. I was very afraid of her anger towards me that I could feel that existed from the time she reincarnated when she was 15 or so, when I was 15 or so. And, and so I was very upset, upset about, like, oh, no, this is not what I expected. So I had to work through my expectations about, like, what emotions she had and so forth. Once I released all of those... I could at least speak to her. It took me uh, nearly three months to get to that point. Right, so three months of dealing with quite a number of different emotions to get to the point where I felt like I could do that. And my feeling be true. Does that make sense? The feeling be true. Anyway, let's get back to some of these things that I've uh, got to be digressed here. Because I want to mention a few things. I want to talk to you about what I am and what I aren't. All right. Look, I just happen to be Jesus, and I'm sorry that I don't impress you very much, but I just happen to be Jesus. There's nothing you can do about that, or I can do about that, to be frank. But I want you to understand there's nothing special in that. All right? I'm not saying that I'm better than you, and I'm not saying that you're unworthy of my attention, or, and I'm not saying... That, we're, that I'm uh, more powerful or somehow uh, stronger or in, in any way better than you. What I'm saying is, this is just who I am. But the fact that you know these truths... Sorry, hi, Asia. How are you? <laughs> the fact that you know these truths, you are special in some way, aren't you? Well, if we start getting down to nitty-gritties, you are special in another way too. Oh, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really good to know it because I don't even know it for myself yet. <laughs> you're, one step, you're one step ahead of me then. Um, but it, it's really, it's, every single person here, God has created uniquely and for a unique end result in the universe. That's the beauty of us. Now, in my soul's case, we were created uniquely for the purpose of being the messenger of truth. Many of you were created uniquely for other purposes. Right? That doesn't make me better than you. It just makes me different to you in one particular aspect of my soul. But then you can see how you're drawing people to you because you know these things and we don't. Yeah, but you are not incapable of knowing them either. No, that's no, what I'm saying. No, I'm learning. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm yeah, doing. That's right. So, so um, I'm not saying to you that you can't do the same as anything that I've done. In fact, many of you, and I've said this even in the first century, many of you will do things better than what I've done. Does that make sense? Yeah. In all sorts of different fields. Like many of you will have all sorts of different, like, you'll just have all these realisations that, oh, I want to go and do some scientific experiments about this and I want to, and all these different things will all come together and, and I'll go, wow, that was fantastic. You know, like, like I never thought of that. And so the, case, the truth is that all of you have unique qualities and attributes and all of us need to start realising them what they are. So that doesn't make me better than you, it just makes me have something that you don't have, just like you don't have, if that makes sense. And so look, look at each other as equal to each other. Many of you are not looking at me as equal to you. 
and that's an error. I am equal to you. I'm no better, no worse than you. Although many times I feel I'm worse, but I am no better or worse than you. Um, I was just wondering if there's any more of those pieces of paper. Is there any more of these? <laughs> there is. If we just, uh, is there a few people that need them? If I just, if, if I just grab them from here. Yeah, I'll just grab all of them. From here. If you can just hand them out down there, that'd be good. Thank okay. you. All right. Now, the, pl the role that God placed me and my, and my soulmate in, the two of us, God has placed, or well, the one soul you can think of it as, the role that she has placed us in is this role of being able to be a messenger of truth. Now, God's created lots of messengers of truth. Some of them are not people. Like the law of attraction is a messenger of truth to you, right? So there is a lot of ways for you to determine truth. But one way is for you to have a listen to me. <laughs> and I know that might sound like, like a bit big-headed, but the truth is that I do know some truths. And, and many of the truths that I do know are truths that are yet to be proven by many of you, but in the end will be proven as true in your life. Now, all I would like is for you to listen to them and to listen to them with an open mind. I'm not even saying you have to believe them. All I would like is that you listen to them and then you just experiment with them. Put them into action in your own life. All right? So instead of going down the track of, oh, can I really trust him? Can't I really trust him? You know, what? Don't forget all of that and just say to yourself, I have total control over my own life. Right? You all have total control over your own life, do you not? Yeah? Many of you believe you don't, but the truth is you do, right? If I have total control over my own life, I can exit anything at any time I want. So you can listen to AJ for a day, for a week, for a month, and then you can decide, no, I don't want to listen anymore, I'm sick of this, and do whatever you want. You're allowed to do that. Right? God's not going to punish you for doing that, and I'm not going to punish you for doing it. And even if you get angry and mad with me and write a heap of bad things about me on the internet, when you in a year's time realise that maybe I was right about something and you want to talk to me again, I'll just say no worries. Right? <laughs> because in the end, I know that eventually your soul is going to cry out for truth. Right? And eventually one of, the, one of the things God has provided to you to find truth is is our soul, Mary and myself, our soul. And eventually the, four, the others of the 14 who come. And, and then eventually, actually, one of the reasons, one of the things God has provided to other people is your soul to help them with truth. Right? Just like God provided a lot of different things historically to mankind, all different kinds of people. Like many of you are not worried too much when we say that Mozart or Beethoven were fantastic musical composers. Do you feel really challenged by that? Like, <laughs> so why do you feel challenged when I say that I'm Jesus? See, it doesn't really make sense, does it? There must be an emotion going on. Can you see that? Inside of a person if they're challenged by it. And the emotion must be something like, well, you know, if I'm saying I'm Jesus, then, oh, he's not my Jesus. Like, my Jesus was me when I was seven years old, and he doesn't look like him, doesn't smell like him, he doesn't taste like him, he doesn't... <laughs> so he can't, be, he can't be him, right? And, and so we go down this track of judging it and getting upset because we don't want to give up something inside of us emotionally. You see, every time we get upset, every time we get angry, every time we have all of these different things, they're just emotions of error inside of our soul that we need to experience and release. That's all they are. And if we experience and release them, we'll get beyond them and we'll find the truth. You don't have to know whether I'm who I'm saying I am right now. Just have a listen and see how you go applying the truths that are being taught and you'll find that they are actually truths. Right? Uh, oh, just wait for the mic if you get it. It's just behind you. So I've been looking at this whole situation as kind of like a space race because, like you said, there isn't like a... An example that we've got to copy from. Yeah. 
So it's like everyone's kind of experimenting themselves and trying to get to this state by themselves, right? Yep. But at the end of the day, the results from one person to the next person might be the difference between like Sputnik and then the rocket that they the Yanks set up. Like, yeah, yeah. Two totally different things, but they both kind of work. And they both got there. And they both got there. Yeah. So should we even be looking towards other people as you know, as a carbon copy type of thing? What I'm saying is that we need to be looking to God. Right. That's who we need to be looking for. And God has provided a path, and it's the path that I am describing, but you don't even need to trust that. You can actually follow your own path and see whether you get to God that way and, and as, as an experiment. And when, when you find you don't find, get to God that way, you can then try this other way. Right. Like God is, gives you complete free will. You're allowed to do anything you want. The key is to understand, though, that God has provided a way to get to God. And it's the most simplest possible thing you can think of which makes sense really doesn't it like just those three things is all you need to do love of truth desire for God's love desire for God's truth and be humble that's really all you need to do to get to God it's like testing <laughs> yeah I like your work AJ um I've been having some difficulty late, lately uh, regarding not wanting to read ancient literature based on the Melchizedek truths and Jesus' true work back then. You yep. know? And I've, I've often wondered why this feeling's been coming up for me to put the book down, even though some of it sounds really loving and, and quite amazing how these ancient civilizations lived even before your first century incarnation and they were waiting for the Messiah to come, you know, and I don't know how they went when you finally got here. Maybe they didn't recognise you like we don't recognise ourselves. Yep. So the same thing's happening now yep. for all of us. Yep. And I'm just wondering, for me, if I've spent 23 years studying cultures and reading the ancient teachings of the Melchizedeks and who brought Moses here, who brought Jesus here, yep. etc., how much of that is in error? How much of that is in truth? And am, am I in this state now where I've just got to go into the soul through my God union as one with God and drop all that because there's, there's a lot of error in that? When you're reading a book, um, you will find as you get on the divine love path, you can be start reading a book and then you start feeling, gee, this is not that interesting actually anymore. How many of you have found that where... Books that you thought were really interesting before you reread them, you go, oh, how did I find that interesting, right? The role that's actually happening is your soul grew in between those two times. You follow me? So in between those two times, your soul made changes. And you've, you've gotten rid of some emotions, and your soul has made some changes. And as your soul makes changes, and you can start to trust your soul a lot with regard to truth. And what that allows you to do is you pick up a book and you've got your spirit guide with you too, don't forget. And he's going, no, nah, no, nah, sorry, mate. That book's, not, <laughs> that book's not really worth reading. And then you've got a feeling in your soul more harmonious with God's love and you're feeling, a, mm, this doesn't really appeal to me as much as it did before, right? Now, most of the so-called truths that are presented here on the earth are very metaphysical in nature and, and very much based around the spirit being or the spirit life. Right? And once you start opening your soul, they hardly matter to you anymore. You will feel a huge difference inside of yourself. You'll be much more attracted to a work of fiction that causes you to cry than you will be to attracted to a work of non-fiction that seems all metaphysical and might even be true. You'll be much more attracted to something that will help your soul rather than just your intellect. And the, re the reason for that is, is as your soul's capacity to experience emotion grow, what happens is that there's these changes that occur inside of you where you're starting to determine what's best for yourself and what's best for your soul to continue its growth. And because of that, and because of the connection with God is starting to be established, you start, and the connection with your guys, by the way, is heightened by this entire process, you now hardly feel interested in things that would have interested you before, and now you're very focused on the things to do with you know, developing your soul. And you need to trust those feelings. So if you pick up a book and you start reading, you know, you know, people give me books all the time to read, and I read a few pages and I just start flicking through. And, no, I can just feel that this... This material, and did you know actually that through kinesiology you can actually test to see whether this book is actually appropriate for you? Well, 
the reason why you can test it is because your soul already knows actually whether that book is actually going to assist you, right? And so you can even test it that way if you wanted to. There's a physical, you know, metaphysical test you can perform if you want to do it that way. I would prefer that you'd learn to develop your soul so you just trust your emotions and you pick up a book and flick through it and you say, no, this has truth in it, but, you know, why do I want to read it when the truth that I'm looking for is way, way above this kind of truth that's in this book? And that's not to judge the book or the author, but rather it's saying, what does my soul need for growth and trusting my own feelings about that? Many times when we channeled to Paget, you'll notice in the Paget messages, many times we told him, just stop reading that book, you know, like that book is not going to help you. There was one book that he was reading that uh, I think it was Luke or John or myself came to him. I think it was actually John who came to him and said, look, you've got to stop reading that book. The book was a book uh, about, uh, it was a, do, does anyone know the history of the Jehovah's Witness organisation? No, well, it's a, it's a, it was founded basically by a man called Charles Taze Russell, right? And he passed in about, I think it was 1914 or 1913. And he's in the Paget Messages, right? And he's in the Paget Messages because he was brought to Paget so that he could tell Paget that the book's teachings were wrong. <laughs> so that Paget would stop reading it and get on with the real soul development, right? And uh, his beliefs were that there was no such thing as uh, a spirit life. So, it was, they, and the Jehovah's Witnesses still believe today that when you're dead, you're dead, awaiting a resurrection. That they don't believe there's no, they believe there's no continuance of the soul or the spirit body for that matter. And, and so he had these beliefs. He was the one who founded these beliefs. You follow me? And, and Paget was reading one of his books. He was a, he was a prolific author. And so Paget was reading one of his books and it was full of stuff about Satan and, you know, the revelation, interpretation of the book of Revelation and so forth. And in the end, we were just trying to get Paget to stop reading this book <laughs> and get back onto the soul development stuff so that we could talk to him about the truth. Do you find? Well, that's what we were trying to do. And so eventually what we started doing was saying to him, look, just give up reading that book and give up reading that book. Go here because that's really good and go there. And your spirit guides are trying to do that with you every single day. Every single day they're trying to do that. They're trying to lead you down a path. So you think of how many people have come into an audience such as this, listened for a day and gone away and never came back. Who brought them here? Their spirit guide brought them here but it didn't resonate enough with them in their soul and so off they went. Or something I said offended them and off they went. Or something that I confronted in their belief system offended them and off they went. Or something that I confronted in their emotional state offended them and off they went. All right. But if we just trust that God's actually leading us through this process and start trusting our soul and our feelings we will actually find that if we're led to a certain place, trust your law of attraction. There's a good reason for you being in this place. Let yourself work through what that is. Find out the real truth about what that is. When you find out the real truth about what that is, then you can decide to leave it. <laughs> but why leave it when you're still not working through the emotion of it and you still don't know? Not much point doing that. Anyway, I wanted to get back to this guru thing because it's a major problem and I want to stop it. So, I don't want to be worshipped. I don't want you to follow me around the countryside. So all of you who are doing that, you've got to stop doing that. Honestly, honestly. If it, if it takes you 10 hours to get to a place where I'm speaking and you could be dealing with an emotion that you know you have in that 10 hours, so many of you do this, right? Where Friday night, I don't know, something happens and you just start crying and, and off it all comes, right? Saturday, I've got to go to one of AJ's sessions. No, you don't. You don't. You need to actually focus on the soul, on your own soul and your feelings. And if Saturday you need to be crying all day, you need to cry all day. That's what you need to do. You know, get a DVD or something, right? Because that will help you a lot. If you just honour your own soul, honour your own emotions. Right. I don't want to listen to your personal stories and emotional processes anymore. Can you understand that 
six and a half billion people telling me their personal story gets a little weird wearying sometimes. Can you, can you get that? Well, wouldn't you feel the same? Right, how do you feel when one person comes and tells you their story? Or two? Or five? Imagine now there's a hundred or a thousand of them coming and they all stand in line wanting to tell you a story. How do you, how do you feel about that? Now, in our personal interactions, we will have times where we have friends together and I'll find out about your life and you'll find out about mine and it will just be just wonderful and, nat and natural. You do not need me to know what you're going through. You need to know what you're going through. And the only other person you need in that process is God. That's the only other person you need in that process. You don't need me in that process. You don't need your wife in that process, your son or daughter in that process, your mother or father in that process, your psychologist in that process, <laughs> your psychiatrist in that process. You don't really need. Now, I'm not decrying any form of getting assistance. What I'm saying is, all you need to work through any emotions within yourself and anything within yourself is your own humility and God. That's all you need. Not me. I'm happy to say how to do it. I'm happy to do it. Thanks. Um, what if you think Jesus is talking to you? Then I probably am. But that's okay. Like anybody can talk to anybody. Uh, it's just a specific experience I had. I met my guru um, six months ago, walked into his ashram, felt massive fear and doubt, and I had a vision of Jesus, and he said to me, calm down, it's okay, you need to be here. Can I have a comment on that? Why aren't you trusting it? I am. I, felt, I totally trusted it. So why not trust it still? Because now you're saying don't listen to gurus. <laughs> no, no, he's not. Gee, I'm not your guru. Jesus isn't your guru. He just gave you some advice. No, 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 but I've still got that guru. I, I have a guru. Well, you don't need the guru. Okay. But obviously, I said that to you for some reason. Okay. In order to, for you to expand emotionally to a certain point. And I have, yeah. And you have, haven't yeah. you? And being with the guru has been phenomenal for me. It's been hugely transforming. Awesome, yeah. But you don't need him. Okay. Yeah. I'm not saying don't do it. Yeah. I'm not saying you don't need a, you know, those of you who need a therapist, you, you don't need a therapist, but you can do it. It can certainly help you. You don't need them. You know, if they part, if they die tomorrow, how are you going to feel? Let it go on. You can still connect with God without them in your life. That's what I'm saying to you. You don't need them. Do you understand the difference between needing them and actually deciding to do something because it's going to be good for you? There's a big difference between those two things. I am perfectly happy for you to enjoy my company and enjoy time together and learn things. Perfectly happy to do that. But when you start needing me for yourself emotionally, now we're out of harmony with love. Can you see that? You're out of harmony with love of yourself in that state. So I'm not, I'm not, you don't need the guru, but it was good that you went to him because it helped you a lot emotionally. Does everyone understand the slant that I'm coming down? Yeah. So I'm not saying don't do all of these things. What I'm saying is understand you don't need this thing. It's a desire to join you to this world. <laughs> desire. What happened there? Desire drawing you to this person. And if you feel fear, go ahead and do it. And that's what I encourage you to do. You were feeling fear. You were feeling, right, afraid about doing it. Go ahead and do it. Don't stop doing it. Yeah. Is there a difference between fear and just having a gut feeling that says, don't do it? Totally a difference, yeah. Because I find I find those two things hard to determine the difference distinguish between. Between, yeah. between what I feel that I should do. Yeah, or not do. Yeah, or not do. Yeah. And then like just be like, holy crap, I'm way over my head type yeah. of thing. Yeah. And then be very, very big difference between the two states. Fear is an emotion that always needs to be released. So you always need to experience it and release it. And you need to never act upon your fear. So never live in your fear. If you live in your fear. So, so I've heard recently that there are a lot of women are very, who, particularly if they've been childhood abuse, right? A lot of women are very afraid of sex. And so what they do in, in the end is they avoid sex at all costs, right? What's that? That's a fear. That's not a gut feeling that you need to avoid sex with that person. 
It's a fear that is carried around in your body, ruining your body and your life. Does that mean there's a big difference between living in a fear like that and actually feeling the fear and releasing it from you? And that's a whole lot different than a gut feeling that, oh, this man is not going to be good for me. That's a whole lot different than that. Because that's not driven by fear, that might be driven by love. He might be in a certain condition, of, you know, an unloving condition, and you might feel, like, yeah, I can feel that unloving condition and he's not for me. Yeah. Very different states. Yeah. All right, what other things don't I want? Um, what I would like is for you to see, to listen to, apply and follow the teachings that I'm teaching you. By the way, I would like it, but I don't demand it of you. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that oh, all of a sudden we're not going to be friends if you don't do it. You know the only time we're not going to be friends is if you treat me badly. <laughs> I'm going to say I'm sorry, but... I don't let myself be treated badly much anymore. And, uh, and I'm sorry, when you work through your stuff, come back and be my friend. That's the only time I'm not going to be a friend. You can believe a totally different thing. You can believe I'm totally crap, like, like that I'm sitting total rubbish. You can believe all those things, that's fine. We can still be friends. But many people don't feel that way, do they? Like many people become judgmental, become angry, you know, obviously, if you're angry with me, I can't be your friend. Right? When I say your friend, I'm not going to spend much time in your company if you're angry with me. Would you spend much time in my company if I was angry with you? Of course not. Would you? Of course not. If you loved yourself, you wouldn't, would you? Yeah. So why would you expect me to do the same, uh, opposite of that? It's an unloving expectation, isn't it? That I do something that you wouldn't do? Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So please, you don't need to worry about whether I'm ever going to get angry with you. Or God get angry with you, for that matter. I would like you to develop your relationship with God, not with me. Right. So, you know, the thing that's changed my life completely is developing my relationship with God. I've been often disappointed by my relationships with others. And when I say disappointed, I often had a desire to have a close relationship with someone and it hasn't worked out because of the emotions that were involved. And I'm not saying, like, in the first century in particular, it was usually the other person's emotions. Nowadays, sometimes it's a combination of mine and the other person's emotions. You see, what's happening a lot emotionally, and I'll cover this a little later, but where did I put the right? Um, is this. You know how you meet people? So here's person number one, stick figure, person number two, right. Joe and Jane. So Joe meets Jane. Doesn't like her at all, straight away. You had that feeling ever before? <laughs> Just doesn't like her at all. You know what's going on? What's going on is inside of Joe's soul is an emotion that he is expecting something from Jane. And inside of Jane's soul, she feels that expectation and doesn't want to give it. And so she doesn't give back what he's expecting. And because he doesn't give back what he's, she doesn't give back what he's expecting, she's not satisfying her addition, addiction. Or sorry, the other way around. She's not satisfying his addiction right so whenever your addictions are not satisfied what happens you go and find another person that satisfies them and you know, and this is what happens with most relationships on earth most relationships on earth are like a relationship with a fag with a cigarette so let's say here's a cigarette right. it's exactly the same why am I having this cigarette? <sighs> Why am I having it? It satisfies me. What is it satisfying? There's an emotion in me that it satisfies. Maybe the emotion is to get away from stress or escape from stress. So it satisfies me. Does that make sense? So I love the cigarette. I would do anything for one. 
I would, let, I would get up in the middle of the night, freezing cold, get dressed, run down and drive over half the city for one if I have run out. Isn't that right? For many of us who have been smokers, that's been the case. All right. So all we're doing now is just replacing that cigarette with Jane. <laughs> right? Now the emotion I might want from Jane is for Jane to idolise me because I'm a sexy man, right? Sexy Joe. Right? Right? He needs this. Why does he need this? Because he has a feeling inside of him that he's really unloved by women, that he doesn't want to feel, right? So he wants to feel from the woman that she thinks he's sexy. And if she thinks he's sexy, that means he's being loved. So it's an emotional addiction. It's just the same kind of addiction as the cigarette, isn't it? And this is what we're doing a lot of times, is we're actually becoming addicted to other people and the way we're becoming addicted, and, and you know, psychologists and psychiatrists call this what kind of relationship? Codependent, Co right? We become addicted to, but this is happening at the soul level. So this is why you can walk into a room and automatically zone in and feel attracted to certain people. They are probably the ones who are satisfying your addictions. Automatically, at the soul level. Does that make sense to you? Right. So I walk in a room, that person there, bang, zone in on the person and off you go. Because there's a feeling coming from them that satisfies your feeling that you want satisfied. Just like a cigarette is. Right. Dennis? Hey Jay, would Joe be better off hanging in there and feeling his emotions? Hanging in there? Yeah. <laughs> well, in the case I've given, Jane's doing the right thing, isn't she? Can you see that? He has an addictive emotion that he's trying to get satisfied from her and she doesn't want to bar it. She's actually doing the right thing. Right? Now the problem is that Jane may also have an emotion. We'll call her approval Jane, shall we? Wait, wait, plain Jane. <laughs> no, this is approval Jane. Jane wants men's approval to feel good. So, what's going on now? Jane will give back Joe's need for sexual projection in order for Joe to make Jane feel that she's approved of. Can you see that? Right, so what often happens is in a... In a, in a any kind of relationship is that's what's often set up. Now, if we're in a relationship, the question was, if we're in a relationship where we're not getting the thing back, that is actually a good thing. Because it forces us into dealing with our emotion. Now, there's a difference between us not getting it back and instead getting back anger, <laughs> isn't there? There's a huge difference between those two states. So Jane could just say to Joe, if she wasn't giving anything back, she could say to Joe, she's not approval Jane anymore, she's just plain Jane. And she, she would, she'd be sitting down feeling this barrage of I need your sexual approval from him. And she could say to him, you know, you're projecting sexually at me a need for, my, for, for sexual interaction. And I don't want to do that. You need to go away and deal with that. So she could say that, couldn't she, in a loving way. That would be a loving thing to do. Or she could do this, project back anger. What are you doing, Joe? You know, like, you know, get really angry, right? Now that would actually be an unloving state, wouldn't it be? Now, it wouldn't be good for Joe to stay in that situation, would it? Because Joe would not be loving himself if he stayed in that situation. Mind you, Joe's already not loving himself by projecting the emotion at the beginning, but that's a different the story. <laughs> can you see that if you're projecting an emotion of need onto another person you're not loving yourself because you're not actually owning your own emotion right, so it's important to remember that alright so the key with all of our interactions with people really is to own our own stuff the majority of us have got so used to not doing that right, that's the problem we have we are so focused on our addictions that we've gotten so used to not doing the ownership of our own emotion 
that sometimes we barely even notice the interaction that begins between the two of us. Does that make sense? So when couples um, say break away from a relationship because of what you're describing can't get it from the other person and they don't want to feel the emotions so by people jumping straight into another relationship is only like putting a band-aid on the problem yeah most of the time mm. yeah jumping straight into a relationship generally is an indication that we're just avoiding an emotion mm. yeah definitely now Joe might feel very like like he needs to be loved right so Joe needs love that's his need love from a woman now he needs to feel the grief of not having it ironically when he feels the grief of not having it he's in a higher likelihood of attracting his soulmate right, into his life or attracting a person who loves him into his life now if he's in a relationship already where he's not receiving love and he knows it what does he need to do feel it well firstly he needs to feel it right he needs to feel that he's not receiving love but but you to be frank with you you can stay in a relationship where you're not receiving love for 20 years so is that loving yourself no. see what happens is if he's not receiving love and at one point in time he'll release enough of that emotion out of him to realize actually that he can love himself and loving himself means that actually if Jane has lived with him for 25 years but has no sexual interest in him whatsoever that she obviously doesn't love him and he would have then enough self-worth to say well hang a sec this isn't right <coughs> if I love myself would I be living with a person who shows no sexual interest in me would I obviously not right <coughs> so Joe would have to say to her you know for 25 years you haven't been very interested in me sexually now I know it's got something to do with the childhood abuse that you had when you were little or something like that if he knows that or something that occurred in her life when she was she was little obviously causes her to have no sexual interest do you and I want to work through this issue together right or do you want to separate there's no third option there's no another 25 years now he's not given he many of you would feel that's an ultimatum no it's not it's just a statement of love he's allowed to love himself can you see that he's allowed to say hang on a sec if you're not interested in me sexually and you expect me like I'm at one with God he's going to need to eventually become at one with himself right which means he's going to need to be connected fully with to his own sexuality and if he can't be connected to his own sexuality in a relationship because the person doesn't want him to be then she's projecting huge emotions at him to not be the person he wants to become so it's unloving for him to stay in that relationship unless she wants to also deal with the other emotion can you see that so she needs to deal with it might her, her emotion might be she's hated him from the time she met him but she wanted him for security that might be her emotion she needs to deal with that or her emotion might be that she's terrified of sex just terrified of it and that might be related to some childhood events in her life all right there might be lots of different reasons of why she's in that state but love would dictate if Joe loved himself it would dictate that Joe actually deals with something inside of himself but also that Jane deals with some of her stuff otherwise a relationship will not be able to continue anyway we're a bit off the subject so let's get back on the subject I did say I wasn't going to ask the questions like that didn't I I'll have to watch that in the future all right let's look at the section trusting in God when you only trust me you are not on the divine path I'm going to say that again when you only trust me you are not on the divine path you see I'm not asking you to trust me I'm asking you to to think about trusting God and to actually feel about trusting God now 
you need to learn also on that path to trust yourself. So you notice there's firstly, who am I trusting? God. Secondly, who am I trusting? Myself. And then thirdly, who do I trust? Others. When? They are trustworthy. Others only when they are worthy of my trust. How, do I can, how can I determine whether a person is worthy of my trust? By feeling them. It's easy to tell whether a person is worthy of being trusted when you can feel them. Right? If you can't feel them, it's very hard to determine, so just go back to God and yourself, if that's the way it is, until you can feel the other persons. Now, when you're in that state, you will never, ever be afraid of what I will tell you. Can you see that? Because if you're trusting God and yourself, you won't feel like, oh, you know, I need to now follow something from AJ that I don't actually agree with. Would you ever do that? No. You would never do that. Can you see that? You would only fo try to follow something I tell you if you don't trust yourself. If you either agreed with I'm, what I'm saying, then you were trusting yourself. But if you don't agree with what I'm saying, then don't follow it. Because right? you know what's going to happen down the track if you do that? You're going to get down the track of feeling like you shouldn't have done it. And then who are you going to blame? Yeah, AJ, yeah. Right? And you need to, I'll remind you, I'll say, go back to this tape, what's the date today? Go back to this recording and remember I told you that don't do that. Right? When you do that, you cause yourself problems down the track. So what I'm suggesting is, and the, truth, the teachings that I'm giving you will help you trust God and trust yourself. In doing that, you will determine who to, who to be able to trust as well. And the truth is that all of this truth is available to you and it's a matter of you feeling your emotional responses to it. Now, you know what we often do, though, in our trusting process? This is how we do it. Others come first, right? right. By others, I mean general others. Then next comes, and maybe, then what comes next? Oftentimes our, and then where is God? God doesn't even make the grave for many of us. Right? God doesn't even make, how many of you before you started learning these divine truths actually gave much thought about God? Now, many of, some of us did, but many of us didn't think about God, right? Before we began. This was our trust process. So, AJ comes along, starts telling, telling you some things. Do others agree with AJ? No, so AJ can't be trusted, right? That's an automatic assumption when I've got that emotion. Right? Does my family agree with AJ? No, so no, obviously can't, can't see AJ anymore, right? Do my friends agree with AJ? No. <laughs> so can you see straight away by involving all of these people in my assessment of the truth, I'm just getting rid of like lots of truths out of my life. Can you see that? Because I'm basing it on their emotional condition. And their emotional condition is often going to be even worse than my own because they're not seeking truth yet. If they were seeking truth yet, they would have been the ones who brought you to truth rather than you discovering it for yourself, right? So the truth is many times we go to get advice or we trust advice from people who are not even in a condition to advise us. Emotionally, I'm talking about. Now, they think they are. I'm pretty sure that your parents think that they're in a condition to advise you. But many times they've probably told you that, right? You're my son or you're my daughter. Don't you think I know more than you? I'm sorry, but no, you don't. You don't. Like, it doesn't automatically follow that just because you're older than someone that you know more than them. Can you see that? That's totally illogical. It's a totally illogical argument. You can see how the majority of people live their life around this. Because why? Because they are afraid to lose this. And this is how most error gets perpetuated generationally, over and over again. 
If we were all in the same religion, you think the next generation of your children would find it hard to leave it? I'm sure they would. Right? Because all of their friends are in that same religion, their family's in the same religion, they've all got the set of beliefs from the time they're little, and the moment they challenge those beliefs, how does all the parents who think they know better feel? They feel like they're being confronted, they feel angry, resentful, and so forth. And so what do they then do? Shut down the child, stop them from experiencing this new truth that they might be trying to discover? In the end, your fear of those things stops you from doing the trust of God and yourself. So what you need to do is replace these things with God. When you replace it with God, you will find divine truth and you will be able to trust yourself and then you can start trusting others if they're trustworthy. And in fact, you'll know who to trust. And you'll also have this really strong feeling inside of yourself of confidence inside of yourself that you're living in truth, even if not a single other person on the planet knows what you know. You will have that confidence inside of yourself because you're trusting God and trusting yourself. When you define your life by this, right, it's just going way out of control. Now, my feelings are that I would like you to start thinking about replacing this as a method of determining truth with what I've suggested to you, and that is God and yourself. Trusting those relationships. Now you notice I have nothing to do with that. Right? Nothing to do with that. I'm in the others group. That you need to give up. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and your family is in the others group and your friends are in the others group. And who's really going to help you determine the truth is your connection with God and your trusting of your own feelings inside of yourself. That's what's going to lead you to divine truth. Yeah? So the reason why I wanted to say that is that my desire for the future, my vision for the future is that every single person on this planet gets to the state where they trust God first and then they trust themselves and then they trust others who are trustworthy. Now, if we're all trusting the same source, don't you think that at some point in the future we're all going to come together? Of course. But if we're all trusting different sources, don't you think that at some point we're all going to go apart? Of course. This is why friends can't speak with other friends. Even some of your own friends can't speak with some of your own other friends. Why is that? Because they're not being brought together. They're trusting all sorts of different things other than God and themselves. Yeah. Right? Why is it that whole nations can't get together? Because one nation is trusting a certain thing and another nation is trusting another belief, all different beliefs and they can't get together because while we're not trusting God first, we will never come together. So... There is one basic truth about natural love that I haven't talked much about. And that is, it is not a permanent force to bind people together. You think about it. Your love, whatever love is inside of you, will change from day to day to day. Will it not? You can marry a person, be totally in love, and then five years later, hate them. Can you not? So how did that happen? How could you be in love one moment and then five years later dislike the person? Doesn't that show you that unless you have some kind of binding force that's external, your own love is not necessarily a trustworthy thing? So that's why I'm saying trust God first. So let's replace these things that we're trusting with God. Trust God first. God is the binding force of all of us. Right? God's love is going to be the binding love. It's, that's the thing that's going to change the world because my personal loves change from moment to moment to moment. So my suggestion is to focus on God and her love in your life and focus on trusting yourself and forget about trying to trust me, get my approval, 
all of those different things. If you're in your emotional state, go for your emotions and really connect, drive in this connection. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because already I'm even finding that people are becoming so reliant on me that they're forgetting that they've got God right next to them every single moment of their life. And they're forgetting that there's that relationship there. Now, for many of us, we don't even believe that relationship's there yet in our soul. If that's the way it is, talk to God about it. Talk to other people about it, but talk to God about it. The problem with talking to other people is that you're going to get their beliefs of the whole thing. If you talk to God about it and you work through your emotions, which is all to do with yourself, you will find the truth of the whole thing. And it won't be influenced by any single other person's opinion. Now, that isn't to say that other people will not influence you in some way, because always we influence each other. Obviously, the people who are more loving in your life, you're going to feel a very positive influence from. Obviously, the people that are less loving in your life, you're going to feel a very negative influence from, right? So start seeking out people who are more positive influences in your life. And, and stop trying to spend time with people who have negatively influenced your life. And I don't mean negatively influenced in the sense of confront your emotions, because that's a fantastic thing, that's positive. I mean a negative thing where they treat you badly, where they're unloving to you, where they're angry with you, where they're resentful of you, where they want to punish you. Right? You don't need those things in your life, right? So start acting. Why am I staying in a relationship with anybody, friend or family or husband or wife, that they are actually projecting all of this sadness or all of this anger at me? Why am I staying in this relationship? Obviously, I don't love myself. Work myself way through those emotions and get to the point where I can actually start trusting God and myself. You will get to the point where the only person you need in your life is God. That doesn't mean you won't want lots of other people in your life. But the only person that you will need is God. Now that is a very safe place. Because you know what? God always responds. And if you're not feeling God's response, it's because of what's going on inside of yourself. This. Is it possible to be needy of God? Um, Certainly, like, but God's like, God, God is really good with regard to emotional projection. She never responds. <laughs> Do you understand? Like, in, in a relationship with a person on earth, I can go, if I notice somebody has a certain emotion that I need from, you know, to feel good about myself, I can have a lovely relationship with them and they'll respond because they have the need to do that. God doesn't have that need. That's the beauty of working through your relationship issues with God because God doesn't project anything at you that you think you need. He only projects at you the things that you actually need. And what's the difference between needing God then and being needy? Like, is Well, many of you know that already, the answer to that question, don't you? You can feel when a person's needy of you, can't you? Or when a person desires you. You can feel the difference between those two things. Most of us do. You know, when we first meet a person, we go, oh, like, there's this emotional, and it feels like your energy is being dragged out of you, right? And the other person just dragging you into their, like, it doesn't feel loving, does it? Right? That's what neediness does. Right? What God do, has is desire. And having a desire for someone is a very powerful thing. And it's a very powerful thing to bind a couple together, for example, is having a desire for each other. But having a need for each other is a very damaging thing. Right? So in the end, we will need God in the sense that we desire God only. Does that make sense? The term desire rather than need to, to show you the difference between those states. So when we're asking God to help us and, you know, like if we're having all these, having, going through some pain and can you help me and is that being needy? A lot of times it is because we're going through some pain and what do we want mostly when we're going through pain? No pain. No pain. We want the pain to stop. But God's, what, what is God saying to us? Most of the time, 
feel it, feel it. Feel it, feel it. Hey, everybody, hey. Right? You need to feel it, right? You need to feel the pain. And a lot of times when we're crying out to God, we're actually crying out for God to stop the pain. So um, is my desire in harmony with God's desire for me? Do you think God's going to answer that one? No. What we need to do is allow ourselves to feel it. When we, can f when we feel it, God can reach in and help take it out of us. But if we're blocking the feeling of it, God can't do that operation because it would be against my free will to do it. Can you see the difference? So the truth is that when we're feeling pain, a lot of the times we are asking God to stop it and that is a needy projection which God cannot answer. But if we're asking God to help me feel the pain completely, stay in this pain until it's done, then that's far more harmonious with God's desire for us. And of course God will assist that in every possible way. Can you see the difference? So many times we project that God demands. God doesn't respond to demands. Did you know that about God? You try. How many of you want a car? You go out and ask God one for one. God doesn't respond to demands from you. God responds to asking. And asking is having a desire for it. God responds to that. If the desire is pure and harmonious with love, God will respond to your desire, right? But God does not respond to your demands. So many times when we're working through emotions, we often demand things of God, don't we? We have that feeling in us, <clears throat> if you don't give that to me, you know. And I had that quite a lot at times, so I had to get rid of that to have a desire for God. All right. Let's keep going. Over the page I'm talking about some issues of truth and your addictions, which we've already discussed a fair bit of. My desire for you is to deal with all of your addictions. I don't mean that you have to. I'm just saying my desire for you is to deal with them. My desire for you too is to stay in truth and not compromise truth. Many of you are still compromising truth in your day-to-day -day life. You see, what, what am I doing here? Let's say we've got Joe, whoops, Joe and Jane. Joe feels that if he's projected out sexually, he's loved. That was a sexy Joe? Well, it's not. He, he doesn't feel he's sexy, really, does he? He's feeling that he's unloved, really, isn't it? So let's deal with his causal emotion. And the only way he can feel love is to have a feeling of sexual desire projected at him. Right. Now, Jane, that's what he's projecting. I'm unloved, I need you to love me, and the way you can do it is by making me feel good sexually. Jane feels that emotion barraged at her, because it's actually an unloving thing for that to be pushed at her, or at anybody, at any woman for that matter. But she feels that. Now, if she is really truthful with herself, if Joe isn't her soulmate and Joe isn't her husband and Joe isn't anybody that she really wants to have a sexual relationship with, then to actually give him the emotion he wants would be compromising her own personal truth. You can see that, can't you? Yeah. So to actually project back at him, like the sexual projection, would actually be compromising her own personal truth. Now, historically, and this is something I'd like to raise with you, is historically the people who have made the most progression even on earth and in the spirit world have all been people who will not compromise on the truth. And one of the things we all need to learn personally at the emotional level, at the soul level, is never to compromise what we feel to be truth within ourselves. And in particular, when we know it's divine truth, to never compromise it. Every time you compromise truth, 
you will feel more pain. Right? That is guaranteed. That's guaranteed. So, Jane might know she has a desire for approval, right? But if she has also a strong desire in herself that she's developing, that truth is paramount, she will not even project the sexual feeling that he wants from her to him, even for the sake of getting approval. Can you see that? So, to illustrate from my own life what, how that's affected me in this particular sen in this century, there's been many times when I haven't wanted to get up in front of a group and say that I'm Jesus. Right? Well, for obvious reasons. Like the majority of the audience, firstly, doesn't believe you. Right? So you get this barrage of emotions initially of total disbelief. Which, if I'm feeling my own emotions, means that you just discounted my entire life. Can you see that? It's like me saying that, like it's me picking out one of you like Monica and saying, you're not Monica. You never had your life. It's the same as that, right? That's what I get every time. Now, if I'm not owning my own emotions, and instead I want a nice feeling from my audience, it would be wise for me to not say I'm Jesus. Can you see that? Because if I don't say I'm Jesus, then a lot of you might give me the nice approval emotions because I haven't said I'm Jesus because you can believe I'm AJ. <laughs> you follow me? But what I've had to do is confront within myself my desires for approval and actually still tell the truth even though I'm afraid of what the results will be. So I've had to learn to not compromise the truth for the sake of anything. Does that make sense? And what I'm suggesting to you in your own life is you're going to need to do the same. Not compromise the truth for anything. Now when you compromise truth, you have an addiction. So if you write that down for yourself, every time Jane compromises the truth, she has an addiction. It might be an addiction for friendship. It might be an addiction for love. It might be an addiction for approval. It might be an addiction, addiction for lots and lots of different things. And the way to discover it is to ask yourself at any moment, did I just compromise truth in my relationship with this person? Did I just tell them the whole truth? Or did I modify the truth, <coughs> embellish the truth, make the truth look better than it really was, and so forth, for a reason? And if I did, what is my, not is my, what is my addiction? See, a lot of times what we do is we say, oh, I couldn't tell them the truth. You know, they wouldn't handle it. That's total rubbish, you know. That is your addiction, not their addiction. They might not be able to handle it, and what might they process back at you? Anger. What are you not handling? Someone being angry with you. That's your addiction. Does that make sense to everyone? And whenever I compromise the truth, I have an addiction, and I need to discover it. Because it's inhibiting my relationship with God. Jen, thanks. How do you get to the bottom of it if you've got compatible soul injuries between the partnership? Well, this is where you've got to always go back to asking yourself, am I compromising truth? Forget about the other person. What they're doing is immaterial to you. You mean personal truth? I'm talking about all truth. Right? Whenever you don't say the truth to somebody or don't act in truth with somebody, then you are compromising the truth within yourself. But my personal truth is color, coloured by sexual injury. Yeah. And therefore, in trying to resolve that and come t to <coughs> the, the real truth, 
it's still coloured by um, imprinting and sexual addiction and... Okay, so, so you know you have a sexual addiction? Yes. Alright, so, so what you do is that's your addiction? Yes. Now, every time you project at the other person that they've got to satisfy your addiction, you're out of line. And so you don't focus on the partner, you just do your own stuff. You just... Yeah. yeah. That's what... They're not there to satisfy your sexual addiction. And see, In what, what happens... In the partnership, can it, ev can it ever be repaired? That If you've got compatible soul injuries, can it ever be repaired? Of course, your law of attraction with other people is always exposing your soul injuries. So even if you've got a compatible soul partnership, and by the way, most of us, when we enter a relationship, right at that moment, that person is the most compatible to our own injuries as any person on the planet when we enter the relationship. Does that make sense to us? So if that's the case, then what we need to start doing is actually allowing our addictions to be confronted. So first, to do that, we firstly have to see that it's my addiction. So if I'm yelling at someone because they're not having sex with me, who's got the problem? The one who's angry has got the problem. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, the other person certainly is not going to feel like having sex with a person who's angry with them or wanting, or wanting to them to have sex with them and get, get angry with them if they don't. So if the other person doesn't choose to change at all, all you can do is just change within yourself. Totally. Yes. Yep. Yep. And as soon as you make your own progression dependent upon somebody else, you are out of harmony with love. Thank you. Actually, whenever you make your progression dependent on somebody else, you are out of harmony with love. Love of yourself and love of them, by the way. Because you're not loving them, expecting them to do something they don't want to do. What, what is paramount with love? Love and free will. Remember the word free, words free will? Free will means I'm allowed to not do something. That means if I'm in a partnership with someone and they don't want to do it, they don't, they're allowed to not do it. Right? So, you know, if you're a husband and wife and you're in a partnership and your wife doesn't want to have sex with you and you're the husband, she doesn't have to. But you don't have to stay in a relationship either. And if you've stayed in it for 20 years, you need to look at why. You've got an addiction too. She's got an addiction, but you've got one too. She might have an addiction of, being, of controlling a man or whatever. You've got the addiction of being controlled by a woman. Right? So there's some addiction going on. So allow yourself to see that everything that's happening is actually my addiction to whatever it is. Whenever I compromise truth, that is your flag. That's like your beep, 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 beep warning sign. You know, that beep, beep, beep. Compromising truth, compromising truth. <laughs> No. James compromising truth. Everyone let him know. James compromising truth. You know, this is the system that needs to happen inside of you. And you can sit down with that and you can say, ah, well, I just compromised truth. What would cause me to do that? I'm addicted to something. What's my addiction? What's my addiction in this particular time that I compromise the truth? And it might be just a very simple thing is someone walks along the street and says, how are you today? And you say, fine. How am I feeling today? Oh, I was just crying and I feel pretty terrible actually. <laughs> Why did I just compromise the truth? I'm addicted to something. What am I addicted to? In that case, maybe not being judged or not being thought of, of as foolish or not wanting to enter into a conversation with somebody. <laughs> to tell them how I really feel. It could be lots of things, couldn't it? Just a simple interaction like that. And if I allow myself to see every time I compromise truth, then I'll also, in the end, allow myself to see every addiction I have. And if I allow myself to see that, there's a higher likelihood that I'll actually get to the bottom of the addiction than there was before I began the whole process. So allow yourself to see how important the truth is to you. It's so essential. It cannot be underestimated how important it is to you. The truth sets you free completely. Right. And divine truth is the only thing that is going to help you in your long-term future.
So really what you're saying is that you're either addicted to getting a feeling or avoiding a feeling? Both. You might be one of those two things. Yep, spot on. So a lot of times we're addicted to getting a feeling or we're addicted to avoiding a feeling. So many times, like, how do you feel when someone's angry with you? Uh, a lot of us feel really terrible about ourselves and we feel ashamed or we feel scared, frightened. We're addicted to actually not being that or not feeling that. So it'll be one or the other. Either want an emotion or want to avoid one. Yep. Now, if we're on the divine path, do we ever want to avoid anything? No. Far Can away. I just say, wanting the emotion is actually the avoidance also. Like, the reason we have the addiction is to avoid feeling our emotions. So, it, it, all addiction is really avoidance. Yeah, so all addictions are the result of us not being humble in the end. 